I grew up in a village in North Yorkshire where my father was headmaster of a small boys boarding school and my mother, who was a qualified teacher, uh, ran the boarding house. I was one, the middle of three daughters. Uh, we went to the local Church of England primary school and of course it was in the days of the 11 plus um, and not a lot of people from the school passed the 11 plus but we did all pass the 11 plus and went to the local girls high school. It was a very good school partly because it was small and partly because the town is such a lovely town that the teachers came and stayed. They were a bit fuddy-duddy and old-fashioned. Hardly any of them were married, because that was in the days when you tended to have to choose between marriage and a family. Um, and in fact, I grew up thinking that's probably what you had to do. And that's because my mother was of the generation of trained women teachers who were obliged to give up work when they married in the 1930s. And that's why she wasn't teaching when uh, my father became headmaster of this school. But it was wonderful that she was a qualified teacher because when my father died very suddenly, uh, when I was 13, uh, she sort of picked herself up, dusted off her teaching qualifications and uh, became headmistress of the village primary school. And looking back on it, what a wonderful role model she was. My headmistress did think that I stood a reasonable chance of getting into Oxford or Cambridge. My best subject at school was history, but she was a historian, and she said to me, well, Brenda, I think you ought to be going to Oxford or Cambridge, but I don't think you're a natural historian. Should we try and find something else for you to study? And she said, what about economics? Now, I'd done economic history, for A-level, and I hadn't enjoyed the theory very much, and so I thought I probably wouldn't enjoy reading economics at university. Uh, but I'd also done uh, constitutional history, um, especially of the 17th century, uh, as part of my history course. And so I said, no, I don't fancy the idea of economics, but what about law? And instead of saying, nonsense, girl, girls don't do law, she said, oh, what a good idea. We can't help you in any way, but, you know, it sounds like a good idea. And as it turned out, it was a very good idea. There were three women's colleges and 21 men's colleges. So I think the women all felt, almost all felt, a deep sense of privilege that we were in this wonderful place, getting this amazing education. There were, I think, six women reading law in Cambridge then. The first full-time woman judge had only just been appointed in 1962. There'd been a part-time recorder of Burnley, Rose Halbron, appointed in the 50s, and there'd been a Metropolitan Stipendiary Magistrate appointed in 1945. But apart from that, women were not visible uh, in the law at all. I'd thought about going to the bar um, and had applied for a scholarship uh, to one of the inns of court and had not got it and had not liked what I saw when I went for the interview. Um, and people were still being put off going to the bar if they didn't have money or connections, and I had neither money nor connections. I decided... Uh, I didn't really want immediately to go and do the solicitor's exams because I had worked hard for my Cambridge exams. Um, and I wasn't really attracted by the city. It was something about the atmosphere that I didn't quite like. Possibly being a country girl, I don't know. So I thought, um, what about teaching, law teaching? Um, because by then, you know, I was getting very good results and it, you could, at that stage, get a law teaching job without a postgraduate degree. You can't do that now, but you could then. So I applied to Bristol and to Manchester for assistant lectureships. And they both offered me, and I chose Manchester. Hmm. 
Now, what would have happened if I'd chosen Bristol, I wonder? Because Manchester, uh, I chose for two reasons, one of which was uh, they had famous professors who'd written books that one read as an undergraduate. So it was intellectually a very stimulating place. And the other was that they wanted me to qualify as a barrister and do some part-time practice at the bar. I was very lucky to be offered a pupillage in what was a good set of chambers. Uh, and I was pupil to uh, a very senior junior barrister at the Manchester Bar who became a circuit judge just at the end of my pupillage. But I was told that he didn't approve of women at the bar. So halfway through my pupillage, I plucked up courage to ask him, my I've heard you don't approve of women at the bar. Yes, he said, that's quite right. Well, why, I said, your wife's a doctor. <laughs> ah, he said, well, medicine is a caring profession, and women should, of course, be carers, uh, but the bar is a fighting profession, and women shouldn't fight. What's more, he said, they don't know how to. Um, they're either too stubborn or too yielding. After I'd been in practice for three years, uh, I was basically put to my election by both Chambers and the university. Uh, chambers were, at that stage, splitting up. Um, some of the very best people were setting up a new set of Chambers with some other people from other sets of Manchester Chambers. Uh, and the, the leader of the breakaway group said to me, well, Brenda, we'd be very happy to have you with us, but you'll have to come full time. Um, and the university, of course, was saying, uh, it's about time you published more. Uh, because obviously, as an academic, you don't just teach, you have to uh, research and publish as well. So I had to choose, basically. And I chose the university for three main reasons. Uh, my then husband was also at the Manchester Bar, starting out the same time as I was. And uh, we thought that it would be a good idea if one of us had a salary, uh, because however modest university teachers' salaries are, at least university teachers do get paid, whereas barristers can take a long time uh, to get paid. But the main reason was much easier to combine having a family uh, with university teaching than with practice at the general common law bar. So I made that choice, and a year or two later, we had a daughter. My daughter says that she remembers going to sleep when she was a child to the sound of my typewriter. So she, of course, grew up with uh, a working mother. I went back to work when she was three months old. She will, of course, have lost out on some things, I'm afraid, uh, but she always had the model of a mother who, who worked. The most important thing was undoubtedly the Children Act 1989. Uh, and that came about uh, as a result of happy coincidences. Uh, the law relating to children in care, the childcare system generally, was in a terrible mess. And Parliament had said it ought to be reviewed. And the Department of Health and Social Security, as it then was, said it ought to be reviewed. But they didn't actually have the resources to do it. And so uh, we offered our assistance. In the Law Commission, we were looking at the the law relating to children as, as between parents, not as between the state and parents, but as between the parents themselves. Uh, and we produced recommendations about that. Again, the law was in a terrible mess, and so we wanted to tidy it up and make it coherent and principled. And the really great good fortune was that we were able to legislate for both of those projects in the same Act of Parliament. But of course, the reason I was appointed a law commissioner were the things that I'd done as an academic. Because one of the things about being an academic is you have to get your show on the road. And so you know, I wrote a book about mental health law because I was teaching mental health law. 
And that got me my first judicial appointment as a presiding legal member of mental health review tribunals. I started a journal on social welfare law, and that got me appointed to the Council on Tribunals, which was then the supervisory body for tribunals. Something that I was doing uh, got me uh, invited to become an assistant recorder. That's, you know, Crown Court judge. And I think it was those sorts of things. They knew about me by then. Uh, And then another book that I wrote with a colleague um, probably prompted the Law Commission. So it's all of those sorts of things that I did while I was an academic that led to the public service career later on. As a judge, you have to be patient. You have to be courteous. You have, of course, to be fair in the way that you treat people, but also in the way you think about the cases. You should be starting at the beginning with, you know, what's the evidence? What are the witnesses saying? Who's telling the truth? Uh, what does that lead me to in terms of um, the sort of decision I must make? If it's a question of law, um, what are the legal materials, the statute or the cases or everything, uh, and, and the principles, and what does that uh, lead to? I think that's... I think that's what you ought to be as a judge. (laughs) I was the second woman in the Court of Appeal. And again, you know, um, all credit to Lady Justice Butler Sloss, um, who, again, didn't pull up the drawbridge behind her at all. And she had a much harder job than I did because I think she felt that she wasn't really welcome when she first joined the Court of Appeal, whereas I didn't get that feeling at all then the first woman law lord, which is much more significant than becoming the first woman justice of the Supreme Court, because we were all new. In 2009, the Supreme Court was set up and we were all first, if you see what I mean. But the first woman law lord in 2004 was much more significant. Um, And that did feel really scary. There are lots of reasons, uh, you know, for wanting... um, uh, a more diverse judiciary. And of course, we're not just talking about gender. We're talking about ethnicity. We're talking about professional background. We're talking about social economic background as well. All sorts of dimensions of diversity. Um, but number one reason is legitimacy with the public. But I don't think the public any longer take to a situation where the law is being made or their lives are being judged um, really important decisions that may affect them for all their lives are being taken by a narrow section of society. Number two is, think of all those able women lawyers there are out there who've been qualifying in equal numbers to men for decades now, and we're wasting all their talent by not recognising it and appointing them. And a third reason is that it's symbolically bad. You know, the law is supposed to be about justice, fairness, and equality. And it doesn't look very fair and very equal uh, when the judiciary don't look very equal. And then the final reason, of course, which is much more controversial, is does it make for better judging as opposed to a better judiciary? Um, and that's very hard to answer. Uh, But I do think there are some things that women can bring which wouldn't be there or aren't there as strongly as they uh, are when there are women around. It's almost as if our absence is more important than our presence. Um, Because if presence can can bring something, but it's the fact we're not there that matters quite a lot. Um, And there are different perspectives because, like it or not, women lead different lives from men. How would I define myself? Mm, I'm not sure I could define myself. Uh, I define myself principally as a very lucky person who's had the enormous good fortune 
to have a wonderful family, um, a useful brain, a capacity for hard work and concentration, and being in the right place at the right time, rather a lot of times. Um, so I think that's how I would define myself. I hope that I'm a good lawyer and a good judge. But really, others are going to have to judge that, not me. <laughs>